I'm Greg Murphy. This is our third session for Innovation Forum. Um, in our first session, we talked a little bit about RFM analysis, uh, recency, frequency, monetary uh, shaping of our data to do some standard analysis on uh, your firm's data using a lot of standard models. It's a common set of analysis we see in um, uh, uh, online firms, on professional services firms. So, so there's a lot of great models out there in the space built on top of RFM. We're going to extend that today to get to client churn. Uh, we're going to go through some steps, though, talking a little bit about cohort analysis. So cohort is basically the idea that we're going to group our clients together. Any of our clients that were opened in the same period, we're going to treat as a cohort. We're going to treat them as the same group of clients um, to understand their shared behavior across our systems and try and predict um, uh, others' behavior based on, on whether they're in that cohort or not. Uh, we're also within that going to get into client segmentation, which is also where we got to with RFM. Uh, so with RFM analysis, just be aware you can do RFM analysis without machine learning. You can segment your clients and do client segmentation with RFM analysis without any machine learning, without any AI. Um, a human being will just say four firms that uh, have purchased in the last two months and are over a million dollars. They are a premium client. Um, you can simply come in there and categorize your clients in any segmentation you want with RFM without any machine learning. What we got to in our first session was we then uh, applied uh, k-means clustering, which is an unsupervised learning technique, the clustering, that allows us to look for patterns in the data. A human being wouldn't see that it's a million dollars in two months and look for patterns across the entire data set and come up with a, a segment that, that groups all of them as effective as we can. And we use that uh, k-means clustering as a, as a step um, in, in our session one, as well as what we'll talk about today. So uh, taking a step back, talking about, again, it's really a data forum. We've been focused a lot on data science and machine learning, but, but I do want to take a step back and just talk a little bit about some of the, the larger uh, changes we're seeing in the market. Um, so most of our clients have traditionally been uh, focused on uh, performance-based statistics. Most of that came from the time and billing system, the core financial systems. It was always the one system at a firm that had clients, matters, and timekeepers. That was the core system. Um, and it really tracked all of our performance statistics within it, or at least we could derive our performance statistics from within it, uh, profitability being a big one. Uh, as we've really seen things move over time, we're seeing a lot more of a shift into what is the most important system at the firm. I still believe that the, the time and billing system is the foundational cornerstone to your data estate for understanding your clients, your matters, and your uh, people. But uh, there's a lot more shift, right? We certainly see practice management systems coming from Latera, coming from Intap, even coming from Lexis, where they are beginning to shift, you know, what is the most important system? Is it really this back office uh, financial tool or is it potentially your front office uh, partner facing tools. What we've seen is really an explosion in a number of, of other tools in marketing and BD, where it's really beginning to focus on clients. So uh, obviously CRM software has been around for a long time, but finally our clients are beginning to adopt it. They're beginning to use it for more than just marketing lists. They're actually potentially uh, tracking opportunities. And part of that's the maturity and ease of use of some of these systems. Um, so, uh, you know, Intap is 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 a big one that's kind of come out with theirs. Um, Interaction's obviously been a big player for a long time, if if not the leader in the space. Uh, but Dynamics and and Salesforce are absolutely uh, showing up at our account. So, so we're definitely seeing CRM adoption, and I'd say the ease of use of a system like a Salesforce. Um, is is part of that reason. Um, but, you know, all of our legal players are aware of it and are, are shifting accordingly. So I think it's a, a really interesting space. But for me, uh, I've seen the marketing technology, the campaign analytics, um, enterprise relationship management, where we're scraping relationships from exchange. Uh, Interaction has IQ, uh, Intap has Gwabit and relationships now. 
um, Andrew Hive's a big player, a standalone player out there. Uh, Client Sense, um, uh, Nexel. Uh, so, so we're seeing a number of players in that space uh, where they're really trying to scrape those relationships and derive relationship data. That's a big one that I find a lot of value in, if, if not something you're doing today. And the point is that it's all getting down to understanding the impact on our clients, you know, client feedback, client surveys, client relationships, uh, what is our retention, what is our ability to, to get referrals from them. So really understanding all of that information from a client focus is where we're seeing a lot of the our firms move. So first question, what type of firm are you? Uh, again, high level categories, uh, performance, where you're focused on those internal financial looking numbers or potentially this new value-based focus where you're focused on your clients and providing value to your clients, potentially alternative fee arrangements, the fact that you're now shifting potentially um, offshore resources to cut down on the costs for your clients. You know, there's a lot of pressure that's happened to, to law firms in uh, since 2008. And so it's something that we're seeing a lot of our clients focus on this shift to being a more value-based firm. Maybe, you know, you don't have a, enough mature strategy, right? You know, I don't, you know, we, we don't think of ourselves that way yet. Uh, we're not sure, or, you know, uh, you know, other, you know, it's, it's, it's something else. It's, it's not a really one of those two broad categories uh, potentially. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, uh, leave that to Monica. If you want to come back, Monica, uh, or is that, if everybody's yep, I've just in. shared the results. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Is that, Okay, yeah, great. So looking at 50% performance, 60% value. So that's kind of encouraging to me. It's, it's certainly what we see. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised the people that showed up at Wilson Allen's Innovation Forum are already firms that are potentially moving to that value-based shift. All right, let's see if I have lost my ability to tab through. So just, a, I don't want to PowerPoint to that. Well, it's all PowerPoint really, but you know, don't want to just focus on, on some of the high level things, but just be aware what we're seeing a lot of our firms focus on is trying to get to it, that larger data estate, come up with, with some joined up data state. One of the focus is trying to build out that strategy. So, so um, just be aware that, that we do see a lot of firms that are now trying to implement some type of firm strategy when it comes to your data estate. One of the things that emerges across all of this, this new uh, system integration um, for this large joined up data state is master data. We've certainly done a lot of work with master data databases, um, uh, uh, Intap Integrate and, and uh, the, the Boomi platform is something we, we see a lot of with all of those disparate uh, B marketing systems. Master data has always been a critical component to that for getting up joined up companies, joined up contacts across the system for that. Um, but just be aware, we're, we're kind of beginning to see the emergence of potentially the need for master data management software. So uh, Samarki is a big one in the market. Prophecy is a big one in the Microsoft space. Tibco is another one we see in some of our clients implementing. So just be aware, master data databases or something, you know, the hub and spoke model, certainly something uh, we've seen a lot of in our careers, but uh, but now we're, you know the need for a, a professional piece of off-the-shelf software with master data management is something that's emerging as well. Just talking about about some of the governance and the resources, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to the people. It's not about software; it's about organization and structure. So just be aware that that that's where we really see you know the firms that are engaged in this strategically are going to formalize these roles, hire new staff, uh, actually engage with us to help you, uh, but but really trying to focus on, on building out that team, uh, generally internally, um, it, or, or potentially augmented, but certainly having those formal roles, right? Where, where someone is, is the owner of the database, someone is the owner of the data for that data um, area. Uh, so just question, second question, again, we're trying to get as engaged as possible in the forum. So we're trying to ask the questions and, and get you guys engaged and get the cross-pollination. Uh, what is your top data priority? Uh, is it the data governance, trying to come up with a holistic plan? Um, is master data management a potential issue for you that, that you feel the pain coming? Um, is it the, the firm-wide data estate, potential data lake as strategy? Um, uh, for, for you, analytics, which is obviously what I love and near to dear to my heart. 
um, and the AI and ML, which is which is a little bit very similar to analytics, but but um, you know sort of that next generation uh, where it's a new skill set, a new role with data scientists and potentially uh, different technologies than we just use for pure analytics. Okay, it looks like we're looking at master data and firm wide data state at, at about 27%. Okay, good to know. Data governance uh, lower than I would would have thought just based on the feedback I'm hearing. Analytics, uh, you know, again, not surprising potentially for, for who attended this session and, and love to hear it that analytics is, is still uh, your top priority. Um, and uh, and AI, AI and ML, not, not as far along as, as potentially I would have uh, thought for, again, the, the group that, that is attending today. Well, that's great for me to hear. Love hearing that. Um, sorry, I seem to have trouble getting a little long farther. So as we talk about the analytics um, a little bit, uh, this is a preview for what we're gonna do for our next session, but um, just talking, we kind of have, we categorize things in the classic analytics space, the descriptive analytics, a lot of that time and billing data went into BI systems as we call that. And so that's kind of where most firms should be today. Some of our firms still aren't there, you know, it's a, new to BI. Um, but we really have this modern data analytics platform uh, concept that's that's out in the market where uh, we're leveraging big data tools, potentially data lake, cloud technology. Uh, we're landing more than just your time and billing data. We're landing your CRM, relationship data, survey data, contract data, uh, unstructured data, PDF, PDFs and Word documents are all being able to be landed in the lake in this modern data uh, platform. And, and predictive analytics is a little what we're going to talk about today. We're really trying to get to prescriptive, right? Like what, what can the machines and the AI models tell us we can be doing that we didn't even know we could be doing? So just be aware that that is a, um, that journey is where we see our clients wanting to get to. But where are you today with BI? You know, we do, we do BI on top of our financials. We're using BI on top of our financial and our CRM, some larger joined up data warehouse. Um, we have BI, but it's only what our vendors provide. If you have a, Elite Data Insights, for example, if you have Intep's um, SciSense solutions is only what they potentially provide. Um, and then, you know, you know, again, no, not yet. Uh, so, so, and that's really interesting to see. So, so 29%, 25% uh, tracking, 25% um, for, for, uh, for we don't really have a BI, BI solution today. That's, that's uh, also interesting to hear. And also someone that likes to work in this space, also uh, exciting for me to hear. Uh, but also 38%, more than I thought, where you, where you have your BI and financials are actually joined up with your CRM or other data. That is very impressive. I'm very impressed to hear that today. I thought that would have been a lot lower um, uh, in the mix. So, so uh, good to know. Sorry. PowerPoint and the surveys don't like to play together. So talk a little bit about RFM. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides because this is really from session one, but um, recency, frequency, monetary. We, based on these core uh, features, as we call them in our inner data science parlance, um, based on these features, we now segment our, our clients and we can decide you know, who's a bet, loyal customer, best customer. You can come up with this RFM index to, to, uh, to track those things. Again, you can do that without machine learning um, and then we can build from there. Uh, so we're gonna build out the feature matrix, um, determine the cutting points for each feature. So we're gonna bin uh, our features uh, into into a a segment essentially essentially for each feature, decide what the scores will be, uh, you know what the value of those the weightings will be, and you know communicate the 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 business value of that data. So just if you're not familiar, if you missed session one, uh, there's it's recorded. You can come back and watch the whole thing just to see the distribution of what the recency is, what the what the the distribution of the frequency is, and what the distribution of the monetary is. And what we're seeing here is that you know a lot of our it's probably true for yourselves. A lot of our clients, uh, you know, when they when you engage with a matter, when you engage with a project, it's happening almost immediately, right? In the first couple months is the majority of the work gets done. Um, we, we have a lot of long-term clients, so we're seeing some of that there. 
Um, but uh, the frequency, um, a lot of stuff is happening uh, often uh, for, for, for us. And um, most of the value is happening in that, that first month or two. Client clustering. This is uh, not going to get into the into not too repetitive from the first session, but basically this is this is a scatter plot of all the attributes within our model, and we can do dimensional reduction um, using a, a T S and E PCA is another popular one I'm a big fan of, uh, and once we do that dimensional reduction, we take all the features in the model, drill it down to one dimension, and then we can cluster on top of it. This is the shape of our clusters that came out of that analysis. Where oh sorry where we could see our uh, uh, recency, our frequency, and our monetary breakdown. And based on all that information, we came out with our segments. Who's a champion? Who can't we lose? Who's potential? Who's loyal? Who needs attention? Those are the ones that a lot of my client, my clients are interested in. Who are the ones that need attention? Who require activation? These are the ones that they want to focus on. Now, moving beyond that, getting into our churn, we're going to take the, those concepts and expand upon them. We are now going to get into what I call, or I shouldn't call it, but is a term in the, in the market, is cohort analysis. This is where we've taken, based on the opening or start of a client, what, um, what other clients were open around the same time. Uh, what potentially, um, how much work are they acquiring? How much do they purchase? What's the quantity? Uh, all the, the same statistics from RFM are there. And now based on, on some time series analysis with the look back uh, within the RFM model, uh, the look back to our cohort uh, group, our cohort opening index, we can now see what our retention rate is for the customers in this model. Now, uh, a lot of what I'm presenting is gonna be demo data for this only because ours is a little too sensitive to show, but just be what we, we, we eat our own dog food. So I do everything uh, I share with you, we do internally. Um, so I, I am gonna share some, some interesting stuff when I looked at some, some of our data um, because I wanted you to see the impact of um, the pandemic. And so now this is a much, uh, I don't even try and read it. You can just focus on the colors, right? Um, this is much more detailed data set. And what we can see is that, uh, Within the pandemic, we see these big missing cohorts, really. Not that we had no clients come in, but relative to um, relative to normal periods, you know, uh, the, the late summer, August uh, 2020, you know, we, we, we were not acquiring a lot of new clients. Um, and that's sound, that tracks well, that tracks well to my memory. Uh, you can see it's still a little spotty uh, moving past that into the fall, but then into the next year, you can just see by the by the color, you know, the, the density of the colors here that as people came back, they stayed very dense, as well as what you can see is um, for the firms that we did engage with before things really fell off, you can see, you know, the shutdown itself was a big gap. Uh, people did engage a little bit after the shutdown. We then really had that that sort of dry spell late summer. But what people who did engage, you can see that they then uh, were heavily engaged moving forward, right? So so there's definitely sort of a uh, a bubble in the pipe there, um, in the hose, right? The 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 backup in the hose where although that there was a dry spell during the pandemic, you can see that that it was offset a bit by the people that had purchased uh, between March and August. Uh, or ha have been heavily engaged since. Um, and I also do wonder if some of what we're looking at there is potentially just bad data, right? You know, <laughs> how much were uh, the data entry specialists uh, just affected by the pandemic, right? That that potentially they, you know, uh, their their day-to-day -day operations, uh, we we just set everybody to, to July 31st, potentially is the open date for anybody that came through September. Uh, quantity is another one. So average quantity for customers, we can look at this by cohort and we're able to see um, how much people are purchasing. And again, this is a nice distribution of, of what you can see uh, based on some of our demo data. Again, looking at stuff, you can see very similar, the breakdown for, for the pandemic, which again, this, is, this, is, this has been normalized since then. I, I, the end date here is uh, the end of 20. November 2021. So I have other analysis that uses an entire year of history, 
which is why I started with that date. So, so certainly this bubble would be would be farther back um, in, in the analysis, but it is really interesting to see some of these things. And I have another series where I did some 2008 pandemic, uh, not pandemic, some 2008 crisis analysis uh, on financials that are in a future session I'll join this up with. So now that we've taken our data and we have broken down into RFM, uh, broken into that shape, and we have now uh, broken it further down, historically uh, looking backwards into our cohorts, we now are going to segment using K-means. So again, we, in our RFM earlier, we didn't have that cohort tier before we got into clustering. The K-means method is basically the ability to come in here and break these pieces down so that you can see each group within a particular grouping. Um, we can see within here the relative importance of this information. So you can see based on my dummy data um, that we have uh, which feature for which cluster has the highest value. So we can see, we can see this information uh, broken out and the importance of the value as a heat map. So, so that's something else you'll see us doing is really focusing a bit on the value of information within our analysis. So unlike other you know, classic analysis or business intelligence, we have the ability to um, understand the value of the data itself, understand the value of the features within our model, understand the value of the features in the predictions. So when it comes to data science and AI, just be aware that um, there's a lot of uh, constant checking within the model to understand is it performing well? Is it accurate? Uh, what is the cost of this, the, the uh, analysis? So within, within data science, unlike a lot of um, classic analysis or business intelligence, we're really trying to score ourselves as we go to understand the impact of, of the analysis itself. So now we can see a bit of a shape of the cluster come out um, again, um, happy to share it in a more sanitized form for ours, a much more interesting for our much more um, exotic uh, shapes that came out within our data. But it is really interesting to now understand that if you've never seen like a spider chart like this or uh, a radial chart, uh, just just be aware that you know we can now take some of these concepts and plot them multi-dimensionally so we can actually kind of get a shape of what the data looks like. Uh, moving then from the the cohorts, the client segmentation, we've now done our clustering. We now have our, our segments based on our clustering. We can now get into churn. And so now we're gonna start looking forward and beginning to understand what is the shape of our data for churn. So we took our data and we broke it into three different time bucketed series. Uh, for, for my production data, it was uh, November, 2022, November, 2021. In, uh, and then May 2021 for this demo day that's going all the way back to 2013. Uh, but we're actually able to see the difference in uh, the density for uh, uh, within our churn analysis based on um, grouping these different pieces uh, by different periods. And it's been normalized down to the same start period for everything within the data. Um, and But we can plot that now over time. And Looking at our, our, uh, our cohorts, grouping them and clustering them uh, by, by this uh, K-means cluster and index, uh, looking at all that through time series, we can now begin to see what the correlation is to churn to the different data within the system. And this demo, demo data recency is the most important. And that's what this chart is telling us, is saying the most likely thing, uh, the most likely piece to churn our data, to churn our clients is recency. So just be aware if that's what this, this particular data set is telling us, that um, if you ha don't have a lot of touches, if you uh, haven't heard from your client in a while, if especially for anyone on the phone that's that's in the BD marketing role, that's a little... Um, squishier when, when it comes to, to law firms, you know, who, who should be reaching out and trying to touch the client. Um, just be aware that uh, recency is the number one. That's and on, on uh, financial systems. I've run this as well. So it's not, it's not as impactful as, as this particular data set. Um, 
uh, the, the frequency is, is also has a higher impact than this, but recency is still number one. So quite simply, if, you're, if your client has disengaged with you and you're not actively trying to engage with your client, that is the number one factor that is going to drive your client churn. So the retention rates, the churn rates, uh, all these derived statistics, what the, you know, again, the value of the data within the data science and the modeling, what we're trying to do is score ourselves as we go. It's not enough to just come up with a churn rate, it's to understand what within our model um, affects that churn rate. Now, again, it's, it's hard to say it's always causal, right? So it could be that the client's disengaging from you, that's why they're gonna leave you. It could be that you've completely ignored your client for a year and that's why they're going to leave you. So, so we're not really even trying to imply causality, but, but certainly there's a high correlation. So uh, to me, this is, the, this is the kind of great insights we can see from joining up uh, our disparate data sets, uh, doing some machine learning uh, analysis and modeling on top of our uh, BD and marketing efforts and, and understand you know, what behaviors are we doing day to day that have the highest business impact on the business. And so just be aware that, that, um, that the recency in, in how often you, you're engaged or touching your clients has the number one impact on uh, your client churn. And the nice thing, what I love about this, and again, I didn't stage it this way, this is what the data told me, is that that is actionable information for the BD marketing team. It is nice to say, ask an attorney to go nudge their client. It is also nice to be able to say, we can host an event. We can do uh, a campaign. We can reach out with a client survey. We, we have the ability to take action on this particular uh, piece of intelligence out of the system. Just looking at some of the prediction pieces, just be aware, everything I've done, there's code behind all of it, and it's predictive. So we can actually send in those attributes of what was the recency, what was the frequency, what is the value, and we will come back with predicted churn. So just be aware, it's not just that these are pretty charts. What's really happening is this is a predictive model that this is based on, and we can actually send in uh, uh, potential attributes for a new client or uh, clients outside the, the, the training data set and come back with what our churn will be. So again, just to highlight, hopefully you focused on it enough, but just so you can see programmatically what the value of the information is. And you can see that recency is by far uh, the, the highest value of information within that model. Okay, and that is it for time. And I just wanna ask the final question, what is, it, is anyone doing client segmentation today? So 20%. Um, are saying they are doing some type of client segmentation. So big opportunities for everybody on the phone. If, if this is something you're looking to do, if this is something that um, you have any interest in, you know, these are, these are you know, relatively standard models that we have that, that run right on top of Enterprise 3E, Adderant, uh, Interhive, you know, all, all of these sort of standard systems that we discussed. So if this is something you're interested in, happy to help, but also happy to help you, right? Uh, the, the point of the forum isn't to just be uh, one-sided. Um, we, we, you know, we want you guys doing it and we want you guys talking to each other.